How did the Rorschach inkblot test become a pop culture phenomenon? And can it actually reveal anything about your personality? A psychiatrist holding up an inky blob and saying, what does this look like, to a patient on the proverbial couch is usually considered more of a film gag than a medical remedy, but the Rorschach inkblot test has a history as a real method of medical evaluation. So how did it move from a psychiatric evaluation and then a personality test to a pop culture punchline? So to dive into this history, we first have to ask, when did personality tests emerge and why did we start administering them? Well, the study of human personality traits stretches back into some iffy scientific methods methods in the 18th and 19th century, when scientists were looking for a way to regularly uncover desirable or undesirable traits. Take for example, phrenology. This weird science was developed in Vienna by physician Franz Joseph Gall and entailed measuring the shape of your head and feeling the bumps on your skull to determine something about your inner traits. Weird and ultimately very inaccurate, since phrenology also has a history enmeshed in scientific racism. But the earliest personality tests or exams and systems established to measure your personality without having to measure your brain bumps starts in the early 20th century. But before we get to ink blots, perhaps the earliest example of a personality test is the Woodworth Personal Data Sheet. Developed during World War I by the United States Army, it was designed to test potential recruits for susceptibility to shell shock or the types of stress and PTSD that soldiers were afflicted with after combat. But the test was only geared towards measuring potential instability and not actually geared towards looking at all aspects of a test taker's personality. So that leads us to our next question. How did the now infamous inkblot test emerge? Swiss psychologist Hermann Rorschach popularized and invented the test in the early 20th century, although he drew his methods from a variety of sources. Rorschach trained with psychiatrist Carl Jung, but he also had a background in art since his father was a drawing instructor. So he had a passion for psych and psychedelic patterns. And although Rorschach never attributed the origins of the test to this, there were also popular children's games that utilize inkblots like blotto and klexography. But but Rorschach did invent using inkblots to measure patients' unconscious thoughts and traits. This idea dates back to the mid 19th century and other 20th century psychiatrists such as Carl Jung and Seisman Hens greatly influenced Rorschach's work. French psychologist Alfred Binet also had experimented with using inkblots as a testing measure for creativity. And Hens' use of inkblots to study patients was uncovered by Rorschach in 1917. After that, he began developing his own famous test. At first, Rorschach wasn't using the inkblots as a test, but rather as an experiment in perception. And important side note, they're not actually ink blots, but drawings that he made himself. He wanted to use the symmetrical spots to see how different people view the world differently from each other. His early uses of the ink blots focus on the differences between how patients with schizophrenia responded to the blots versus patients without schizophrenia. He found that people who didn't suffer from hallucinations or disordered thinking had generally similar answers, whereas those that did suffer from those symptoms had answers that fell outside of the standard responses. Over time, he decided to standardize his tests and methods. He felt that this test was effective in measuring early diagnoses of schizophrenia because patients who suffered from hallucinations had substantially different responses to the blots than patients who didn't. So the ink blots were useful in getting patients to describe their sense of perception. His earlier models of the test from 1918 to 1920 featured 40 plus ink blots, but after his initial trial, he reduced the number down to 15 blots that he believed were significant. In 1921, he published his book on the subject, Psychodiagnostics, but it received little fanfare. But the number of ink blots was whittled down to 10, since that's as many as the publisher was willing to feature. Sadly, Rorschach himself didn't live to see the full impact of his creation because he died in 1922 at the age of 37. So the name Rorschach has become linked to ink, but considering the test wasn't a massive success until after his death, then why did Rorschach become a household name and why did the test proliferate across pop culture? So as it's difficult to find an all-encompassing answer to this question, but I have some theories. The first is that after Rorschach's premature death in 1922, the test spread to the US and was translated into English and other languages. Although he originally intended for the test to focus on patients with mental disorders, soon other psychologists were using it in criminal defense cases to test soldiers returning home from war, as a test for children, and as a personality test for college admissions and job placements. 
Without Rorschach around to give guidance on the limits of the test or how to apply it, others began to find and apply different diagnostic measures for the infamous inkblot. So the test we see now is derived from the original Rorschach inkblot findings, but has taken on many evolutions since then. As for pop culture, the inkblot exploded in popularity, especially in the mid 20th century, alongside the expansion of film and later TV. One reason for the test proliferation might be that the test is visual, which is extremely helpful for film and TV storytelling, and something of a departure from other contemporary personality tests that focus largely on questionnaires and words. Seeing the stark black and white image on screen could be a more compelling example of psychiatry than simply hearing the words, even though some of Rorschach's original blots are in color. And having a person in a film or movie reveal the projections as clues to their inner thoughts can serve as a powerful narrative device or a set up for a good joke, depending on what they see. As a result, inkblots have popped up all over visual culture, like in Get Smart, in Andy Warhol's 1980s paintings, as a gag in an episode of Golden Girls, as a character in the Watchmen comic book series, and even on a line of tropical shorts that the Pentagon designed for World War II veterans in the 1940s. So all of this information on a pop culture anomaly is interesting, but it's time to ask perhaps the most pressing question of all. Does the inkblot test actually work? Well, even though the Rorschach may have fallen out of fashion, some argue it can still yield useful results. The Rorschach is a projective test, meaning that the image itself has no meaning outside of what the patient projects onto it. So by showing a person a meaningless blob and asking her what she thinks it means, then she's actually telling you about herself and the way she views the world and less about what the blob really is. Rorschach's initial interest in the test was seeing how differently his schizophrenic patients interpreted the images versus other patients. But it wasn't until 1939 that the test was broadly used as a projective test of personality. And a lot of the criticism around the test comes from a set of real concerns, namely that Rorschach intended for the test to measure disordered thinking, not personality traits. That piece of the test didn't flourish until after his death. So can we really trust the results? Also, the person administering the test can inject bias into their interpretation of the patient's responses about the image. Different test givers can inadvertently create two different personality profiles, causing some to question the reliability of the outcomes. And also, now that the images are readily available online, the test has been somewhat compromised. But some psychiatrists still consider it a useful tool as part of other therapies. There have also been attempts to standardize the test results, such as the Exner scoring system, which is sometimes called the Rorschach Comprehensive System. Developed in 1960s and 70s by John Exner, the system looks to increase the reliability of the inkblot test by creating a standard method for interpreting patients' responses. So how does it all add up? Well, while tests like tell us your favorite side dish and we'll tell you what Disney princess sidekick you are may not have any merit as a psychological evaluation, inkblots aren't as frivolous as all that. Rorschach's initial interest in diagnosing disordered thinking alongside his own attraction to perception in art led him to this unusual psych test. The little inky blobs had a history as an evaluation for schizophrenic patients before becoming a projective test and eventually ending up as a psych gag splashed across 20th century screens, which makes a certain amount of sense since you can see in the test whatever you like. So what do you think? Want to take a look at one of these ink blots and tell us what you see? Any other new info on the history of the blot? And before we go, we wanted to give a shout out to one of our viewers, Natalia on YouTube, who asked to know more about the history of personality tests after I mentioned them in our episode on women in computer programming. Thanks Natalia and send us more recommendations on topics you'd like to see covered. We'll see you next week. We had so many great questions from last week's episode on why kids have their own bedrooms. Ananya on YouTube asked about what other cultures outside of the West develop separate sleeping habits. Check out the link in the description for an abstract on studies of sleeping cultures in Japan that shifted away from interdependence and to more independent sleeping arrangements between mothers and babies. Also the text, Sleep Around the World, Anthropological Perspectives, edited by Katie Glaskin and Richard Chenhall. Thanks Ananya. Max Jensen on YouTube also asked about the promotion of separate sleep in workhouses and why twin beds were portrayed as ideal in the 20th century. Benjamin Reese goes more into this topic in Wild Nights, How Taming Sleep Created Our Restless World, which I mentioned last week. The connection of workhouses with communal sleep, with either people divided up by gender but still sharing intimate space, or whole families sleeping all together, was tied by Victorian reformists to illness and disease. The cramped quarters with their low hygiene and poor air circulation 
was portrayed as promoting disease because people slept too closely together. Although some illness was in fact caused by these bad arrangements, it wasn't all actually. So in the early 20th century, when twin beds were being marketed, it was with the tagline that it was healthier to sleep alone rather than too close to another person. Check out the book for more information and also citations on ads that were run in the 19th century against workhouses and in the 20th century for twin beds. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next week. Thank you.